Uh, hello everyone, I'm Danny O'Brien. I'm with the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. And uh, my background is that I've been involved in sort of the activism and policy side of patents um, for quite a while uh, at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and previously. Um, so this is one of those situations where like you kind of assume if you're one of the last speakers that you can just cross off slides as other people cover them and it gets shorter and shorter and i realized that i picked as a topic something that people have alluded to but nobody has covered in particular depth and now i'm just feeling like there's a sprawling thing that i'm going to do a really bad job of explaining and bringing into the rest of the context i also want to say this title remodulating frequencies that's a star trek joke and like i'm trying to broaden out of just star trek and <laughs> golden age science fiction things so i'm going to read some jane austen but i have not yet come up with a jane austen joke um so one of the reasons why this is tricky is because i'm going to be talking about policy and one of the things that people have mentioned is that um, it's not unique by any means to patents, but um, one of the things we, we're dealing with here is a thing that is, is defined by, by statute. And if the statute changes, the thing that we're talking about also changes. So just to give a concrete example um, with intellectual property, you, know, you can talk about the contracts and the license and, and what a token represents and what it grants, but the thing that that actually grants and the enforcement mechanism for it, or at least the recognition about what, how the scope of the enforcement mechanism is is gonna be defined in some kind of statute, and those statutes vary from country to country, and it's just a mess. The other thing is that, that, that those laws and those ideas actually change, and they change despite a kind of presumption that law is this sort of base, base basal kind of um, uh, ground that doesn't change, and in fact the problem is that it's actually rather slow. Um, it's usually true, but, but isn't necessarily true. The final problem is I'm going to talk about this about how that those laws and statutes have changed with patents, um, partly in response to their application and misapplication as digital technology has advanced. And one of the problems here is that in this context, I'm really often trying to think about these things as incentive models, right? Like, okay, how do we, we're building a thing that will have a, a you know, a, a mechanism designed to it. Um, and we don't or often don't express policy changes in that way. We have this sort of great man view of history, great person view of history, particularly on local stuff and particularly when we're talking about activism around this. So um, that's the, on the right there, that's the change in wheat yields that was as a result of the French Revolution and it, it had a huge impact in the, the future um, and whether that impact was greater than just Napoleon popping up is a little unclear but it's definitely one of those things where you can look at the world in one framing or you can look at the world in another. So classically and I'm going to focus here on um, for, for the rest of this talk on software patents because that's one of these sort of like controversial fringes where the law has changed over, um, over the lifetime of everybody I I here. Um, this is the reporting for the first um, software patent granted. I think you can squint. I think it's in 1969. Um, this, <laughs> as the headline describes, full implications are not yet known. Um, and we're, we're, still, we're still dealing with the implications and we still don't know what those implications are. But clearly this is an event, right? And this is an event that changed the nature of the, um, of the grounding but it was also a response to incentives, right? Like there was an increasing pressure to include the world of software into the world of intellectual property. And something that I've actually had to repeat a few times um, and may speak on in a bit more detail in some other context is that really the idea that intellectual property maps onto software and how it maps is incredibly recent. So if you think most people know about software licenses and the GPL and open source licenses, and they sort of emerged in like the 1980, late, mid 80s. Um, it was really only in 1984-ish that it was really statutorily determined that software was even covered by copyright. So those would have both not existed as things two years before they popped up, and also were kind of responses 
to the fact that there was this kind of enclosure going on. It was, it was a sort of reaction to that idea. So um, this is a slide that, that, that has often inhabited pretty much all of the conversations I've had about patents. Um, software patents do not exist in the same way in the Europe as they do in the US, and it was partly for a concerted uh, program of activism between the years 1996 and 2006. The reason why I use this slide a lot is because it's one of those times where there was actually a victory for the people who, um, you know, the plucky um, individual developers um, and, um, and geeks. Um, the big, um, not that fancy yacht in the background is somebody saying, look, you should support patents because they're good for industry and the people in the kayaks are like your little free software advocates um, uh, sneaking in and this was all done in front of the, um, the, the parliament in Strasbourg in Europe. Um, the plucky people with their little sign won, uh, they coordinated very well to defeat this and it had a knock-on effect in the United States of leading to um, a case law like Alice, which sort of restricted the range of software patents in, uh, in the US. Again, kind of changing the whole ground of the statutes that you might be building a Web3 solution on. Um, and this has led to like lots of like wheat yield like analysis and papers um, by folks who uh, were really interested in this, right? So these are a plot of all the kind of actors um, if you go to this, this paper, and I'll put in a link when I, 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 I finish up these slides, um, uh, there's also links to kind of the issues that were topic uh, covered. People love this, right, because it was this big fight that determined stuff in, in a public place. And that doesn't happen very often in policy. Um, I think every slideshow has to have this slide in it um, uh, 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 in this decade. Um, th this, shall I explain it? We can do it in the questions. But basically, th th this slide is conveying in kind of Egyptian hieroglyphic mode that the fact that this was an incredibly intense debate about the nature of software patents was because um, uh, the side who originally produced, um, went to uh, uh, get software patents extended to the EU thought they had an easy win, right? You don't have political battles in public unless one side has made a really bad mistake about whether they were gonna win or lose, right? If you absolutely know you're gonna lose, you don't do it. If you absolutely don't know you're gonna win, the other side doesn't really put up much of a battle. Um, uh, so why, why, why did this happen? And it's actually because uh, in these areas of discussion, um, there were a lot of defections, right? There were a lot of moves. You would think that something like the edges of intellectual property, um, if hard to define in a new technology, would at least be fairly uh, partisan, right? Uh, that, that you would have, you know, Richard Stallman on one side and you would have like Bill Gates on the other and like the lines would be very easily drawn. And in fact, over the last 20 years in this area, people have shifted in their, um, their, their perceptions. So originally IBM was against software um, patents and actually Alex kind of mentioned that like there was a pretty concerted attempt by IBM to kind of seed the ground with prior art in a lot of these things. Um, Bill Gates, I put an asterisk by this because Bill Gates is sort of almost infamously um, known for being against software patents and then switching pro. It's actually due, I discovered, to a misquote that, um, um, uh, uh, um, that was made where somebody put a quote from Richard Stallman in Bill Gates' mouth and everybody thought that like he'd switched violently. But there was a small, there was a small movement, right? Like the, the Bill Gates basically said, this is a really bad situation, but we have to defensively collect patents. Martin Goetz, who's a name that, that isn't quite as famous as Bill Gates, but is actually the, the subject of that uh, computer world headline. He's the person who actually made the first software patent, switched to saying it was a bad idea. Florian Muller, who was, is the big name in this, um, I will get an email from him. Um, if he ever sees this slide, which he probably does, uh, will. Um, but he's definitely someone who has shifted ground over this time. Um, similarly, the idea of small inventors as a group has moved over time as small inventors have shifted from people who make little machines to people who are um, young software developers. And as we mentioned with Alice, the sort of court system has also shifted in this way. Um, 
uh, I would have a really great picture here of like a Brownian motion, right? With like little heads of the great men of history like bubbling around, um, but I didn't have time to feed it to Dali. And what I mean by that is that this is a moment, this is a, a, a interface where lots of these individuals are shifting and changing minds. Um, why is that? Um, I think it's because in the space of software patents and patents applied to technology in general, the benefits are unclear and often based on what other people with other patents are going to do, right? This is why we have patent defense leagues. We have this moment where how, what you benefit from a patent depends on how big the patent repository is of other people. So your status in the, in the industry changes whether you think that this is a good idea. Uh, similarly, benefits are ha heavily situation dependent. And I think this is something that people don't recognize with intellectual property, which is that um, the more I look into intellectual property, copyright, trademarks, um, and the like, um, Actually, they have different effects in different industries. The effect of copyright in the music industry is profoundly different from um, the effect in the sort of fine art or um, graphic design um, space. And actually, that gets reflected in statute quite a lot. The reason why there's a lot of foaming change in intellectual property is because people are always advocating for a different change in the, in the benefits and incentives in their own company, in their own uh, industry. So equilibrium is unstable and alliances are, um, uh, are fluid. So what does this mean if we're going to build alternatives to patents? Um, I think it means that diversity is appreciated, right? We've talked a lot about how statutorily um, patents are fixed. So you have this idea of 14 years, they use monopoly uh, pricing systems. Um, uh, the, the, the range of what is covered and what isn't is statutorily or at least judicially defined. Um, and th this is all codified in regulation rather than in contracts as much as you might expect. So there's, a, there's an opportunity here if we can think of a way of creating a more diverse um, set of agreements between actors. Um, we need a clarity of incentives, right? We need to build an incentive mechanism where it's very clear um, who is benefiting from what. Um, and uh, um, th that, we struggle a bit in mechanism design in conveying the, uh, our incentives often because it's new. I think we would, I would say that this is potentially a positive thing because the incentive clarity is really bad in IP right now. Um, so the, the matching isn't that bad. And like I say, alliances are unstable and I think you might find some unusual bedfellows if you build something that provides uh, an alternative to the existing regime. That is it.